Well, thank you, Dwayne. Thank you for those kind words, and thank you for praying for me. And uh, thank you, everyone who is here at Cornerstone Baptist Church for this very special National Conference of the Gospel Coalition in Canada. I'm also grateful for all of you who are watching online, and uh, we are grateful for your support for TGC here, and your, for your love and your passion for God's Word and God's truth. I'd invite everybody here now, if you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians. We're going to be looking at the last paragraph of chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. When our executive uh, director, Wyatt Graham, asked me to uh, bring the final address uh, for this con conference today, he informed me several months ago that the focus would be on the Great Commission. And um, at that point in time, I think he said something along the line of God for us in mission. Uh, and then it kind of got changed and morphed into our, um, our mission uh, despite uh, everything else. And uh, so we're thinking of our mission now this morning. We're thinking of the fact that we are called to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, of course, where our mind immediately goes when we think of the Great Commission, uh, when Jesus said to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Trinity, and then, of course, to teach them to observe everything that he had commanded us. And, of course, there is that wonderful, encouraging promise that he added to the end of the commission, which is, and I will be with you. Surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So that, that promise is all about God being with us and for us. Now, Colossians chapter 1 is, in my opinion, a little bit of a, a restatement of the Great Commission that Jesus gave in Matthew 28. And I say that because these are Paul's words. Remember, Paul was not there on the mountaintop with the uh, 11 when Jesus gave the Great Commission. He did not become an apostle until a significant time later. And so Paul didn't hear the Great Commission directly from Jesus' mouth on that occasion just prior to his ascension into heaven. Paul received this by revelation of Jesus Christ later, as he talks about in the book of Galatians and, and in other places. And so here Paul, in a sense, restrate, restates the Great Commission. The word commission is actually used in the text we'll look at in just a moment. He doesn't add the, the, the word great to it, but he uses the word commission. And I think it's safe to say that even though Paul does not specifically mention, for example, baptism in Colossians 1, it, it is there in a sense because he talks about the word of God and he talks about presenting God's word. And so it's a restatement and the various components of the great commission are all here. Personally, this this passage, this particular passage, means a great, great deal to me. I entered into full-time ministry in, the, in 1980 as a missionary going over overseas. And my wife and I served in the Republic of the Philippines for 10 years. All of the 80s we were, were, spent, were spent there as church planting missionaries. And then when that ministry was over, um, the Lord called us to our home church in Toronto, where we served for almost 20 years. And after you've been in ministry for approximately 30 years, you, you, you begin to think through, well, what's ahead of me now, Lord? And at that point, around the end of that 20-year period, uh, the Lord made it clear that we were to move on. And so there was about a two-month interval before I became the pastor of West Highland. And during that interval, it was when this passage had its greatest impact on me. It, it actually became a very formative force in my life because as I was thinking, I consider West Highland to be like my third missionary journey. And I'm thinking, well, if this is it, Lord, and, 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 and this is where it ends, then what, what is it that I personally would want to characterize my ministry for the remaining years that I have in service? And as I said, this passage became a formative force in my life. There are three things in this passage that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at, first of all, um, that our mission is a stewardship. Secondly, we're going to talk about the fact that our mission has very distinct goals. And thirdly, we're going to see that this mission that Christ has entrusted to us uh, requires certain things of us. So I'm reading now Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29. I'm going to start actually at verse 23 because 23 concludes a thought in this passage, but it segues into the final para paragraph that Paul has here that we're going to look at today. 
So at the end of verse 23, he says, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Verse 24, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission, there's that word, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, that is to the saints, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Our mission is a stewardship, a stewardship. Now I want you to see that there's a, a twofold stewardship here. And the idea of, of, of stewardship begins in the 23rd verse, which is the segue into his concluding thought here in Colossians 1, where he talks about the gospel that we've heard proclaimed to, uh, under all of creation and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. The word servant implies steward. There is a stewardship. He uses the word again in verse 25. I have become its servant. Not the servant of the gospel, but the servant of the church. So in verse 23, it's clear. I am a servant of the gospel. Verse 25, it's clear. I'm a servant of the church. So it's a twofold stewardship that's been entrusted to Paul and to all of us who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I said, this concluding statement then is a segue into this truth of stewardship, servanthood. So if you, if you just flip back to the earlier part of, of Colossians, you see this is, is very, very clear. Because in verses 5 and 6, he talks about the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you all over the world. He says in verse 6, this gospel is producing fruit fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all of its truth. And then in verse 7, he mentions this man named Epaphras who was the one who took the gospel to the people in Colossae, to the Colossians. So it, it, it's, it's all about the gospel in the opening stages of this letter. And if you go down to verse 13, you'll see he makes this great summary state, state statement, a wonderful one-liner of what the gospel is. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. From there then, in the, in the next number of verses, he, he, he talks about the one in whom we have redemption, redemption being the one who is the image of God, the firstborn over all creation, that, 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 that he is the one who not only created, he is the one who sustains this creation. And then he talks about his supremacy in the church, the fact that Christ is preeminent over all within the body that is his own. And then you go down to verse 20 and, and 21 and 20, 22, and he, he, he starts to talk about what Christ has done for us. He talks about the cross. He talks about the blood of Christ. In essence, what he's saying in these opening verses of Colossians, he's talking about who Jesus is and what Jesus did. He's, he's talking about the person and the work of Christ. And this is the gospel. That Christ is at the center of everything that God has planned. That God's plan of redemption is all about Christ and who Christ is and what Christ has done for us. So then he says in verse 23, I am a servant of this gospel. A servant of this message. This is stewardship language again. And when we think of the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus... Paul will use different language there to describe this stewardship. He talks there about the good deposit. That is the body of truth, the gospel. The didache or the kerygma that has been entrusted 
to him. And then he is going to entrust that to Timothy. And Timothy is supposed to entrust it to others. And he talks about guarding it. It's all stewardship language. You see, stewards serve the person who entrusts. And stewards serve what has been entrusted into their hands. So in the pastoral letters, it's guard and pro protect. And, and, and here in this passage, it's clear he keeps talking about this gospel spreading. So when we think of guarding and protecting the gospel of Christ, we also need to keep in mind that guarding it and protecting it means proclaiming it, propagating it, spreading it out there. That's what Paul's talking about in these verses. These, these verses imply evangelism. And that's pretty clear in verse 6 when he talks about it spreading all over the world. And in verse 23 when he says that the gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven, meaning it's been preached throughout creation. Sharing the gospel and spreading it to others. So we have this twofold um, stewardship. We are servants of the gospel, but we are also servants of the church. And in verse 24, he, he, he drills down deeper into this truth about the church. He, and now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I'm, I'm going to come back to this phrase. Verse 24 is an important verse. We're going we're gonna to jump over it now, but we will come back, come back to it. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake, for the sake of his body, which is the church. Then he adds, I have become its servant by the commission that God has given to me. He has become a servant of the church. We are called to serve the church. There's a link between the gospel and the church. It is the gospel of Christ that gives birth to the church. When you and I respond to the gospel by the, by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, what happened to us? We were incorporated into Christ. But it, Paul makes it clear in 1, 1 Corinthians 12, For by one spirit have we all been baptized into one body. Incorporated into Christ also means to be incorporated into the church. The, the gospel gives birth to the church. Without the gospel, there is no church. That's why when a church abandons the gospel and doesn't preach it anymore, it's no longer can really biblically be called a church. The gospel gives birth to the church. So serving Christ and serving the church are not just linked with each other. In essence, they are the very same thing. In evangelism, we labor not just to bring people to Christ. We labor to bring people into the church. Because the church is that community, that, that place, that, that body of believers that new gospel believers need to be nourished in gospel truth and to see the gospel lived out in loving relationships. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 that the church of the living God is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. The, 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 the truth has been entrusted to the church and the church then is to uphold that gospel like a strong pillar or a column in a massive temple. The church is gospel-believing people. So the point he's making here is that our mission is a stewardship. And we know in the ancient world that it was quite common for very, very wealthy men to, to entrust very large and great estates into the hands of slaves. They were bond slaves. And they were in charge of everything there, entrusted into their hands. And, and this, in reality, is how Paul thought about this, this stewardship he didn't, he didn't see his stewardship as a servant of the gospel in the church as, as, being, as being appointed to some, to some highfalutin office. Even though he was an appointed as an apostle of Christ. And in, in a sense, you can't get any higher than that. But that's not how he viewed it. He saw it as a mission. He saw it as a stewardship. He saw himself as a servant. This was an amazing privilege, an amazing duty to bring the gospel to the Gentile people. 
We need to be reminded again that we have not we have not chosen our mission and we have not chosen the message of our mission. We are stewards of the gospel and stewards of God's church entrusted with this mission, entrusted with this message. We have entrusted to us a body of truth. We also have entrusted to us as ministers of the gospel a body of believers and we are to serve both. Now, this idea then of our mission being a stewardship leads then to this, the goal of what our stewardship, what our mission is all about. And there are two phrases in this passage that I want you to see. Two phrases that are very important. The first is found in verse 25, the second in verse 28. Verse 25, I have become its servant, the church's servant, by the commission God gave me. Here's the phrase, first phrase, to present to you the word of God in its fullness. I believe the English Standard Version says to make the Word of God fully known. It's a great line. To present to you the Word of God in its fullness. And then go down to verse 28. We proclaim Him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present. There's that word again. Present. Present what? Not the Word of God, but present everyone perfect or mature in Christ. So keep these two phrases in mind, to make the Word of God fully known and to make the people of God fully mature. Because we are servants of the gospel, we must make the Word of God fully known. Because we are servants of the church, we must make the people of God fully mature. And of course, these two things are linked because because the Word is what we use to bring about growth. The, The Word of God, the Gospel, is essential for spiritual growth. So to make the Word of God fully fully known, this phrase has the idea of 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 laying it out. It's almost like a um, a map that you would spread out onto a table. To, To 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 lay it out so it can be seen. To, to lay it out, to, to reveal what it says, to expose it. Paul didn't have the term expository preaching in his mind, but, but in essence, in a sense, that's what he's saying. To exposit it, to explain it, to lay it out so that it is clearly understood. That's the, I, the idea. So the idea then is there's a focus on, what is, on the content, the content of what is to be presented to the church, presented to God's people, presented to the world. And when he says the word of God fully known, he's he's saying the the fullness of the gospel, the full gospel, so to speak. And what is it? Well, notice what he says then in verse 26. He then adds the mystery, the mystery that has been kept hidden for generations, but is now disclosed to the saints To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now let me just make a couple of observations here. The first thing we need to to underscore is we need to remind ourselves that Paul is underscoring this truth, that the Scriptures, the Word of God fully known, the mystery, is all about Christ. From beginning to end, the Bible is all about Christ. Every part of Holy Scripture points to the person and to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible touches on all kinds of diverse matters, but its ultimate focus is the person and the work of Christ. And even the Old Testament is not fully understood and grasped until we understand that it always points to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible is centered in Christ. It is a Christ-centered book, and therefore it is a gospel-centered book because Christ is the good news. He is the gospel. Now, Paul makes it clear, or he equates making the Word of God fully known with what he calls the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I think it's fair to say this then, that if we, are, if we are not pointing people to Jesus Christ through our use of God's Word, then we are not making the Word of God fully known. I don't know what we're doing, but we're not making the Word of God fully known. 
It's just religious talk. It's, it's nothing more than that. We have to be pointing people to Christ through our use of God's Word. It's not because we're manipulating the Word of God to say something about Jesus. No, it's because everything in the Word of God is about Jesus. The second observation I want to make is that some interpret this mystery here and they tie it into what Paul says in the book of Ephesians. You remember in the book of Ephesians, his, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he, he's making it very, very clear that the mystery of Christ is the inclusion of the Gentile peoples of the world into the new covenant people of God. And so in Ephesians 2, he, he, talks, about, um, he talks about the fact that, that um, the, the, gen, the, gen, the Gentiles were outside, they were separate from Christ, they were excluded from citizenship, they were foreigners to the covenant of the promise, they were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, the Gentile peoples have been brought near. And he goes on and he talks about that in Ephesians 3. And he says, the mystery made known to be my revelation as I've already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Here it is. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. The inclusion of the Gentile people into the covenant people of God. Now that's, that's how Paul puts it in Ephesians. Now that interpretation, reading that interpretation into, into what he says here in Colossians, is, is somewhat, not completely, but somewhat dependent on this phrase, which is Christ in you being interpreted as, or, or changed to, which is Christ among you, meaning among the Gentiles. I don't believe that's what Paul is saying here. The mystery in Ephesians, the mystery of Christ there, is more of a focus on Gentile inclusion. That, 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 that Christ is among them. And that certainly fits with Ephesians. But there's a different focus here. The, the focus here is on Christ himself. And we see that in the opening verses of Colossians 1. It's, it's all about the supremacy of Christ. So the focus here is, is that we, how we, through the new covenant, as, as Douglas Moo in his commentary puts it, are completely identified with their representative Christ and how that new identity gives hope for the future. Christ in you, that's your identity. Hope for the future, the hope of glory. And so verse 28 says we proclaim him. We're not, we're not proclaiming, he's saying, I'm not proclaiming the truth about the Gentile inclusion into the new covenant people of God, though that's true and that's in Ephesians. He's saying, no, no, there's something more to the mystery of Christ, and that is him himself, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, usually when we, when we think of the words of, of being a Christian, that it, usually we use terms like a disciple is someone, and the Bible uses these terms. The Bible makes it clear a disciple is someone who is in Christ. So usually the, the terminology in the Bible is in Christ. Few times is it, is it the opposite way, which, which says Christ in us. But that's what Paul is saying here. Now, we can get into the semant semant semantics as to how these two diff phrases are different from each other. But here's the point I want you to see. The point is, whether it's in Christ or Christ in us, the point is this. Either expression is pointing to an incredible great truth. They're pointing to the same thing. That Jesus Christ is in union with his people. There is a union. There is an intimate relationship between Christ and his people. Dick Lucas in his commentary on Colossians puts it so very, very well when he says, he says this. When we have begun to grasp the greatness of Christ and then grasp the closeness of the union we may have with him, 
He in us and us in him, we can ask no more. We can ask no more. You see, the gospel that we preach, the gospel that's been entrusted to us, is the good news that Christ lives in all who believe in him, giving us his righteousness, experiencing or empowering our lives, uh, empowering us with his life and his spirit, leading all of us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, carrying on that work that he has begun in us to make sure that it is ultimately completed, and saving us daily from the pull and the power of sin. And what Lucas says is, is true. Who can ask for more than that? And yet, his purpose is to give us more. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The gospel we preach is also the good news of an amazing future. Christ in us is the hope of glory. We have this hope that this day is coming when we will be free of everything that is inglorious. And the Apostle John reminds us of this hope. That this hope is the, is the very thing that contributes to our growth in Christ, to our maturation and perfection in Christ. When he writes in 1 John 3, we know that when he appears... We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as Christ is pure. This is the gospel we preach, the word we are to make fully known, that having union with Christ now, we are given grace daily to live with him and in him and for him and to grow in him. That we right now have a grace that is absolutely sufficient for all of life now. But we also have a glory in the life to come. As Lucas puts it, full salvation belongs to the last day. But a real salvation belongs to the Christian here and now. And this is why we must do what what Paul did in verse 28. We proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. You see, Paul doesn't give to us here a, a, you know, here are the 10 steps that you have to do to become a mature believer. All he says is we proclaim him. Because when we proclaim that he is in us and that he is the hope of glory, if you take those two terms and understand them fully, that one phrase, you begin to see that it's all about our sanctification. It's all about our growth in Christ. That our future hope in his coming leads us and spurs us on to love and good deeds. And we become more and more like Christ as we focus our attention upon him. So Paul's focus here is that, his point here is that the gospel is not just for the lost, to bring them to Christ, but the gospel is for the church to help the church grow in Christ. The church is nurtured and matured by an understanding and an application of the gospel. And brothers, this is the goal of our mission. To make the word of God fully known and to make the people of God fully mature. So as we struggle with all of the complexities and the challenges that we've been facing in recent months during this pandemic, uh, the challenges and the complexities of, of people's incredible needs, we must remember this goal. We are to make the word of God fully known. And we are to make the people of God fully mature. So we looked at the stewardship of this mission, the fact that this mission has goals. Now we need to to be thinking, as Paul does here, that this mission that has been entrusted to us also requires a number of things of us, specifically three things that I see in this passage. The first thing this mission requires of us, we're going back down to verse 24, is it requires that we will be ready to suffer, ready to suffer. Now I rejoice, verse 24, in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my body what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church. Now this is a difficult verse. And this verse throughout the history of the church has been misunderstood and misapplied and misinterpreted in, in a number of ways. The worst interpretation of this verse 
is the Roman Catholic Church's doctrine of the treasury of merits, that, that somehow the, the sufferings of the Apostle Paul gain merit for the church. Somehow his suffering, and the suffering of all of the saints, it, it creates a treasury of merit that those of us who lack merit can, can cling to because, because the merits of Christ and his death are insufficient for a full salvation. That's the worst interpretation of this verse. So somehow Paul had to supplement the atoning sufferings of Christ in order to make the atonement more complete. David Garland in the NIV application com commentary is very, very helpful here where he points out throughout throughout most of Paul's writings, particularly here in Colossians, that when Paul talks about the atoning suffering of Christ, he always uses words like blood, cross, death. Here he uses another word, afflictions. I think the next thing we need, we need to say about this, about this phrase, uh, filling up what is lacking in the, in the suffering of Christ or the afflictions of Christ, the other thing we need to say is we should not link this verse with just human suffering in a general sense. In the last panel we had, there was talk about the suffering that, that all of us as human beings endure. I don't think that's what Paul is talking about here. That's not the emphasis here. We have to view what Paul is saying here through the lens of the commitment that servants of the gospel and the servants of the church have. In other words, it is because of our commitment as ministers of the gospel to the gospel and to the church that these sufferings are endured. Paul is saying there's no redemptive benefit to what I'm going through, but he is saying that what I have gone through, the things I have endured, the things that, the afflictions that I have, the hardships I've gone through and experienced, they inevitably accompany the mission to make the Word of God fully known and the people of God fully mature. Suffering happens in the advancement of the gospel, in the advancement of the church. I think the words of Jesus to Saul of Tarsus when he knocked him off his horse on the way to Damascus are, are very, very helpful here. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you persecute me? Why are you afflicting me? Paul was on his way to Damascus to, to get the Christians there. But he was making Jesus suffer in the bodies of those who were in union with him. And if God wanted, if the Lord wanted to underscore that truth even more in Acts 9 verse 16, he then said, I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for my name. The atoning work of Christ is finished. But the suffering of Christ is not over. Jesus continues to suffer in this world by the world's rejection of him and rebellion against him. And the afflictions of Christ are still being filled up, as it were, in those who serve the gospel and the church. And this is the reason why in verse 24 he says, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. Not only because because Paul was identifying with Christ and in, the, in the things that he suffered, but because he knew that what he was going through was, was bringing about good ultimately for the church. Without suffering, there would have been no church planted in Asia Minor. The gospel always spreads, my friends, through hardship. Read the history of Christian missions. You cannot escape this truth. Read the history of church plants. There is always suffering when it comes to advancing the gospel and planting the church. Kent Hughes, in his uh, wonderful book on Colossians, a series of expositions that have been put into print, he illustrates this truth in a powerful way through the missionary Helen Rose Rosevere. I'm sure many of you know that name. Helen Rosevere was from Northern Ireland. And uh, she became a Christian when she was a medical student in Cambridge at the end of the Second World War in 1945. And she went with the well-known mission WEC, the Worldwide Evangelistic Crusade. She went to the Congo and she labored there for 20 years 
In the middle of that time period, in 1965, a great rebellion took place there, and she was uh, apprehended by rebel forces and for five months held in captivity, and she had to endure constant beating and rape. At one point, they were about to kill her, and a young man, a 17-year-old young man who was from the village she ministered in, came to her defense, and he was beaten in front of her to the point of death. Hughes writes in the message he gives in his book, Dr. Roosevelt was sick. For a moment she thought that God had forsaken her, even though she did not doubt his reality. But God stepped in, overwhelmed her with the sense of his own presence, and said something like this to her. Twenty years ago, you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary, the privilege of being identified with me. These are not your sufferings. These are my sufferings. And as the force of that hit home, the doctor said she was overcome with a great sense of privilege. Helen Roosevelt's sense of identification with Christ, of union with him, was elevated by her suffering. And she rejoiced. Suffering is a part of our stewardship. It's a part of being a servant of Christ. Suffering is a part of loving the church. Suffering is a part of laboring for the growth and the maturation of the church. Suffering is a mark of all of this because the dark powers oppose our mission. Brothers in Christ, those of you who are ministers of the gospel... There, there are burdens that you carry for no other reason than you are a servant of Jesus Christ. There are, there are pressures that you are enduring because you serve the church. There are heartaches that you experience week in and week out because you've been pouring your lives into people for their spiritual good. There are demonic attacks that, that pummel you constantly because you are committed to making the Word of God fully known. There are setbacks that, that deflate you because you see people in whom you have poured your love step back from following Christ with all of their hearts. There are problems that plague you because you are committed to this mission. Rejoice, brothers. These afflictions place you in the company of prophets and apostles who were before you. Rejoice, brothers, that you have been numbered faithful. You've been numbered among the faithful pastors and missionaries and evangelists of the past who have taken Christ to the ends of the earth. Rejoice that you have an opportunity to fellowship in the sharing of Christ's suffering. Rejoice that you have been considered worthy to suffer for his name. And rejoice because the good and the growth of the church and glory to your Savior comes through what you have suffered. We must be ready to suffer. Secondly, we must also be ready to work hard. To work hard. Look at, look at what he says in verse 29. To this end I labor. That is the end of, of being able to present to Christ a mature church. To this end I labor struggling. Two words. Labor, struggling. And I think the ESV translates the word labor here as toil. When you, when you combine the word toil, labor with struggle, you, 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 you have a picture here of, of someone who is at the point of exhaustion. It's where we get our English word agony or agonize from. It's, it's the word that was used of athletes in the, in, in the ancient Greek games, how they would agonize in the race or agonize in the fight. I have a cousin um, in Edmonton who's married to a medical doctor, a general practic practitioner, and she informed me just on Tuesday of this week, I was in telephone conversation, that he came home the night, the day before, completely spent because he had 95 calls in one day with patients. This, this incredible amount of patients coming now because, because of, not just because of COVID, but because of the backlog of patients who haven't been cared for because of COVID. And how he just fell into bed completely spent. I have a friend 
who sent me a, a photograph of, a, of, of um, medical, um, medical workers in, in Manila. And the, the pictures of them, they, they've, they're taking off their PPE. And their, their, their PPE is sort of around their ankles in this photo. And, and they're standing there. And these are men and women who are, it looks as though they have been hosed down with a fire hose. They are completely drenched in their sweat having cared for people who are suffering from COVID there. That, that's the picture of what, of what Paul gives us here. And we know that Paul, on two different occasions, the first one in Acts 20, when he spoke to the Ephesian elders, he said, remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you night and day with tears. He said something similar in 1 Thessalonians 2. Surely you remember our toil and hardship. We worked night and day. Brothers, we cannot fulfill this mission without hard work. 2 Corinthians 5 is that amazing passage where, where Paul talks about him and the other apostles being entrusted, being given the ministry of reconciliation. He talks in that passage about persuading men, imploring men to be reconciled to God. He says in that passage that, that people think I'm out of my mind because I'm imploring men and women to be reconciled to God. He says God has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As, as though, though God were through us imploring you to be reconciled to God. And right there in the middle of that passage, when he's talking about, about, about all of those things, he, he adds, there's a line in there. And this line reveals what moved Paul to do all of this. To be considered out of his mind. To be constantly persuading people. He says, for the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. The authorized version says constrains me. The ESV says controls me. You take those three English words, compel, constrain, control. They're all our English attempts to capture what Paul is saying. That as he looked at the love of God displayed on the cross of Christ, he was saying, he was saying it, it now constricts my life. It constrains my life. It controls my life. It, it channels my life in a certain direction, dire, direction as an ambassador of Christ. There is only one direction that I can follow in unceasing labor. It's like, it's like water being constrained into a smaller area and channeled through large pipes. To this end I labor, Paul says, because of the love of Christ. Our mission that is a stewardship, our mission that has these great goals, our mission that is Christ-centered and gospel-centered is a mission that demands hard work, but not work in our flesh, not, not work that, that is generated from, from our own sufficiency, but rather a dependence upon Him. This is not, this is not a work that, that we can do, that we can whip up within ourselves to get our adrenaline flowing, as it were, and, and, and to have the greatest of, of human perfected skills of communication. No, there is a dependence, a reliance on Christ. To this end, I labor struggling, struggling. How? How? With all of His energy which so powerfully works in me. Paul writes about this again in 1 Corinthians where he talks about himself, he compares himself to others and he says, I worked harder than all of them yet, yet not I but the grace of God with me. See, right here in verse 29, he's telling us his testimony. He's relating to us his personal experience. He knew this energizing power of Christ which, as he says, so powerfully worked in him. How do we experience this? How do we appropriate this kind of energy from Christ? Well, in one sense, he doesn't really, he doesn't really even answer that here in this, in this passage. I mean, we could, we could say that Paul knew the importance of prayer, just like you and I know the importance of prayer. Paul would have understood what Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? 
Paul knew and understood that prayer uh, is, 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 it reveals our reliance upon the Lord. But Paul doesn't mention that here. I want you to notice that his words convey an, an, an assumption on his part. He assumes, and rightly so, that the energy is there. It's there. He assumes that what Jesus said is absolutely true, and surely I will be with you always, even during a time of pandemic, to the very end of the age. Paul understood that Christ's incomparably great power is for us who believe, and and he revealed that power. He exerted that power with mighty strength when he he exerted it, when he raised Christ out of the grave. So couple with this then, that the coupled with this then, is that this energy, this experience, this exercise of the energy of the power of Christ always comes when strenuous self-giving service demands it. It is when we toil, relying on Him that God, in this God-given mission, that we receive this God-given power. This power, this energy, this enabling is received when we rely upon Him. Can I be so frank as to put it in another way? God anoints workers. He doesn't anoint lazy pastors. He anoints those who work. And what a blessing this is. Because knowing that He works in us and through us counters our pride. Knowing that He works in us and through us counters our fears. And knowing that He works in us and through us gives us joy in making the Word of God fully known and the people of God fully mature. So brothers in Christ, keep this, keep this Word in your mind and in your hearts. Sufficiency. Sufficiency. As you labor to make disciples, keep sufficiency in your mind. As you encounter difficulties along the way, as you grow tired in the work, keep this word in mind, sufficiency. In Jesus Christ, we have great sufficiency. Hallelujah. In conclusion, let me say these. Let me say say this. There are times when we all need to renew our commitment in terms of our general walk with the Lord, in terms of our life calling. My wife and I have a place where we have gone three times in the last 13 years. It's a little town called Waterford. And um, southwestern Ontario, it's about an hour's drive from our home. And it's very, very close to the place where I came to know Christ in 1972. And three times in the last 13 years, we've gone to this place because there's a beautiful, beautiful park with these ponds and a number of benches that you can sit on, and hardly anybody goes there, so you can be assured of privacy. We've gone there three times to renew our commitment to the Lord. First two times, actually in all three occasions, we were struggling with our commitment to the gospel and to the church. The first time we went there, I was experiencing in our ministry what I would, I can't really define it, except to say a resist, resist, resistance when I preached. I can't explain it, but every Sunday morning when I would get up, I would feel as though there was this barrier in front of me as I preached to a crowded auditorium with people's eyes looking right at me, but I felt as though I couldn't penetrate this barrier that was in front of me. It debilitated me. And I wanted out. I wanted to throw in the towel. And we went to Waterford, which is our Bethel, our house of God. And for two hours on a park bench, my wife and I wrestled with God. And said, Lord, if this is what you want, we're prepared. We're ready. We're willing. Our wills had to break. It happened a second time when we were facing a difficulty in the church in which um, the only way to defend myself was to make someone else look bad. And I knew that wasn't an option. But I was tired. Very tired. And then just this summer, with the height of COVID, with everybody, as it were, on our, on our, on our team and our staff, walking about as though, though we were like deer in the headlights. And realizing that I needed, again, to renew my commitment to the Lord. 
And that's what I would like to do to you today at the end of this Gospel Coalition conference, is that I would call upon you today to make a commitment in three areas. If you are a pastor, if you work in a local church, if you're a servant of Christ, if you have a heart for the church, you love the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if there has been a group of believers that have been trusted into your spiritual care, I would ask you first of all today that today when I have concluded that you would take the time, whether it's in your home, if you're watching online, or even here, to renew your commitment to be faithful to the gospel. Secondly, to remove, renew your faith, to renew your commit, commitment to serve the local church of which you are a part. And finally, to renew your commit, commit, commitment to seek and to rely upon the enabling, empowering energy of Christ. I leave you with this verse. My dear brothers, stand firm. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen.